Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Ling Becker. I'm the Ramsey County Workforce Director and also the Executive Director of our Ramsey County Workforce Innovation Board. Um, thank you for joining us at this Healthcare Futures event. Um, it is so great to have you here today and we wanna thank you for your time. Um, if you haven't already, I would just encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat so we can get a sense of who's in the room and who's here. Um, and so you can get a sense of who's actually interacting on this topic um, with you as well. So I would encourage you to take a moment and just introduce yourself. Um, we're hosting this event today because there is so much happening in healthcare. Um, you know, if you, if you um, help folks um, get connected to healthcare careers, I just wanna thank you. I know it's been a, a crazy time and our community is just um, so grateful for those that are working in healthcare. And so um, there are so many jobs to fill and we wanna share both insights into the sector and inspiration to help people to think about the many careers that are in this field and are looking to build our workforce. So I wanna especially thank our partners um, at the city of St. Paul um, and also at the St. Paul area chamber for helping us to host this event today. And also thank you so much for so many of our speakers who are joining us as well. So um, as a part of our uh, Workforce Innovation Board, one of the practices that we've adopted now for a couple of years is we always start every meeting with a land acknowledgement. And so this morning, I'd like to invite uh, Chad Coolis, who is the Executive Director of the Midway Chamber, but also serves as the chair of our Workforce Innovation Board to, um, uh, do our land acknowledgement for us this morning. <laughs> Great, thank you, Ling. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to make the history that led to this moment. Some are brought here against their will, some are drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on the land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We are standing on the ancestral lands of the Dakota people. We want to acknowledge the Ojibwe, the Ho-Chunk, and the other nations of people who also call this place home. We pay respects to their elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the treaties made by the tribal nations that entitle non-native people to live and work on traditional native lands. Consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that brings us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. Thank you so much, Chad, for doing that. Um, as we kind of progress into our morning, um, now that people have introduced themselves, um, I wanna keep the a little bit of the interaction that's happening in the chat going. And so one thing I'd really encourage you to do is to also um, uh, maybe identify the reason why you're here today. Um, maybe you're a job seeker hoping to learn about some of these careers. Uh, maybe you're an employment uh, professional who is interested in understanding um, the opportunities and in, in certain careers that we're gonna be addressing today. And maybe you're interested in some of the trends and you're just an interested community member or business partner in our community. So feel free to just share a little bit of why um, you're here and what you hope to get out of this morning. And, um, and so here's our agenda for today. Um, we have a really uh, packed agenda with some great information and, um, and sharings for you this morning. Um, first of all, we're gonna have some opening remarks. We're doing that right now with a little more grounding. Um, we're also gonna, um, uh, have Aaron Olson from Real Time Talent share some data and trends with us, which I think you're gonna find fascinating. And then um, we're gonna spend the bulk of our time this morning um, talking with a, uh, three employers in our community around um, emerging and available opportunities that are sometimes overlooked in the healthcare industry as we think about um, non-resident or non-patient non facing um, careers. And so we'll do that. And then we'll have a chance to have some Q&A that is an optional op uh, opportunity as a part of this event to connect with some training programs as well. So that's going to be our morning. Um, right now, I'd like to 
transition to B. Kyle, the president and CEO of the St. Paul Chamber. Um, B is a tremendous partner um, in our work, um, trying to support businesses and our county's economic vitality. And I just am um, so grateful to call her uh, a colleague in our community. So um, B, if you could just share a few remarks with us as we um, start this morning, that would be wonderful. Awesome, thanks, Ling. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be a part of this. I tell you what, Ling, you are a fierce warrior, my friend, on behalf of businesses and employees alike. Uh, we're very fortunate, all of us, to have Ling representing our voice in this space. In this space, so I'm really pleased to be here too. You know, and as Ling said, healthcare is such an important and exciting field right now, and challenging, as we all know. Um, who could have imagined that we would find ourselves here today? Uh, you know, that said, though, ahead of us are so many opportunities and new ways of doing things. And we're really seeing how much there's so much growth and need in the healthcare industry right now. We have several members at our chambers within the healthcare sector, and we know how important they are uh, now more than ever. And uh, so thank you, Ling. Uh, Workforce Solutions, Ramsey County, for bringing us in such that we can be part of this conversation and for partnering with us to provide these critical forums on workforce development. Um, it's my honor, truly, this morning to introduce our first speaker, Ramsey County Commissioner Jim McDonough. I consider Jim a dear friend, and he was born and raised on the east side of St. Paul. He continues to live there today. You know, as a lifelong resident, Jim has just a deep understanding of the qualities that his in neighborhood embodies, including a strong dedication to community. Uh, they recognize the importance of building relationships. He served on numerous boards and committees and represents the east side so well. Commissioner McDonough has been a leader in championing workforce initiatives to meet the needs of local employers and job seekers alike. And his commitment to prioritizing workforce within the county board has been demonstrated over the years as well. So it's truly my pleasure to welcome you, uh, Commissioner Jim McDonough. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, B, and good morning to all the folks on the call. It's great to see well over 50 folks here. B, thank you for that. And I want to take a moment to thank you, B, and to St. Paul Chamber, Ramsey County, and our Workforce Investment Board cannot do this alone. We need strong partners in the community, and the St. Paul Chamber has been one of our strongest partners when it comes to workforce um, in our community. And so thanks for all the work you do, but then also the partnership that we have with you, this strong partnership to be able to put on events like this. I want to thank everybody for attending today's event. A special thank you to to so many of you who are workforce professionals and supporting our residents in a variety of ways. Healthcare is a vital industry in Ramsey County. Earlier this month, the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners proclaimed January as Healthcare Month. In Ramsey County, there are 30, over 35,000 healthcare professionals, including over 700 dedicated Ramsey County employees who work tirelessly to provide quality care for residents and to make our community healthier and safer. We acknowledge the tremendous impact that these workers have had on our community throughout the pandemic. There's a tremendous need in this industry for workers right now. And as we look into the future, today we have the unique opportunity to focus on some opportunities that sometimes go unnoticed in areas such as medical administration, unit coordinators, non-patient career, care careers, and I really want to thank in advance our healthcare employers that are joining us today, M. Fairview Health, Health Partners, and Children's Minnesota. We thank each of you for your partnership with the community and with many of our community-based organizations as a pipeline for talent. And real briefly to any of the job seekers that have joined us today, I really want to thank you for taking the time to be here, but really encourage you. You're going to find the opportunities are really endless, but the healthcare industry has so many paths to entry, um, entry level jobs that can get you in. And this is truly a career um, that can expand and grow as you desire. Uh, my, my daughter's a nurse. She's a nurse at Regions and she knew when she was 12, she wanted to be a nurse and, and she graduated from St. Kate's when she was 22 and she went right to work and the, 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 the passion that comes with the healthcare workers in our industry, where not only can you become self-sufficient, you can support your family, you can be able to take care of the things you want and position yourself 
for a quality of life that you want to enjoy, but it's an industry where you get self-fulfillment. It's an industry where you can really connect with people and see impact immediately with the work that you do. So thank, to all the job seekers that have joined us today, thank you. And to all the partners that are helping provide information to those job seekers for potential career paths for them, our greatest appreciation goes out to you. So with that, I'm gonna turn it right back to Ling Becker, our workforce director. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, I can't thank you enough for your leadership and support of me and our department and the work that we've had to do, particularly these last couple of years. So thank you so much. And uh, Commissioner and I have already been together in Chad since 730 this morning. So their commitment is uh, deep and uh, and just I'm so grateful for the, their leadership. So um, all right, so we're gonna now turn to one of uh, my favorite topics, labor market information. Um, we are so, um, just it's just been a wonderful partnership that Ramsey County has with Real-Time Talent. And uh, Aaron Olson, who will be sharing with you is a great thought partner um, in the work that we get to do together. And certainly um, more than ever, labor market information is absolutely critical as we think about how to pivot our resources and our strategies around supporting employers and job seekers. So, um, Aaron, without um, you know any further um, wait here, take it away, and look forward to hearing what you're going to share. Thank you so much, Ling. Thank you as well to the St. Paul Chamber for the invitation to join you today. Uh, Real-time talent for those of you that are not familiar with us, we are a public-private collaborative that is focused on aligning Minnesota's workforce. Um, I uh, have been with our organization since, since the early days of uh, real-time talent, and I'm so happy to be here uh, today and be in partnership with Ramsey County. So to kick things off, I'd like to share uh, a little bit about the um, the big picture today. I'm hoping that um, that everyone can see my slides at the moment. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I'll, there's so much that could be said here about the healthcare industry and about the state of our economy here in Minnesota right now, but we'll just walk through some of, some of the high level story before we dig down deep into the careers in healthcare that we're really seeing emerging as uh, huge opportunities here in Ramsey County. Back in the first months of 2020, the workforce story was one of talent shortage, and the seven county metro alone accounted for just over half of our state's total forecast shortage at that time. And today we still don't have enough people to maintain the economic growth through growing employment, and we continue to have micro level mismatches in the geography of talent and opportunity, misalignments between skills that people have and the talent needs that employers have. And these issues are compounded by the fact that we have a terribly inefficient labor market too. And so even when we have that right mix of people, skills, and opportunities, these um, outdated systems of finding talent or applying for jobs or connecting with employers often keep those connections from happening. So there are many layers to this challenge. There's no one solution. Uh, really and truly, this is a joint effort. And that's uh, what's also heartening about this is that here in Ramsey County, we're seeing so many partners coming to the table to find those solutions. The, the big opportunity we have is to translate these problems into strong pathways into high demand living wage careers through reskilling, upskilling, and career advancement strategies for Ramsey County community members who are unemployed or underemployed. And so tackling this opportunity in particular for the healthcare industry is one of utmost importance, and not only for our current and future business needs, but also to secure our community's health, our safety, and our well being as we continue to navigate. It's this challenging public health era that we're in. The healthcare industry in Ramsey County represents a significant percentage of economic activity in Ramsey County, a larger share than in any other metro county in Minnesota, and a much higher percentage than we see overall for the whole state of Minnesota. Ultimately, this means that the healthcare industry also contributes uniquely to local economic activity and vitality in the county. The information on the following slides are pulled from a report that was developed by Real-Time Talent for Ramsey County, my colleague, Brooke Dirtsu, who's on our call today as well, uh, it really should get the credit for pulling together the content in this industry snapshot that we'll share today. So uh, when we take a look at the, the high level trends across the healthcare and social assistance industry, uh, it's important to note first that not all industries have been impacted equally by COVID-19. And um, 
even within the healthcare and social assistance industry, there's been a broad range of experience that varies significantly by employer type. Healthcare overall has seen dramatic high demand across all positions in the industry. Employment in the healthcare industry grew by 1.8% during the first quarter of 2021 alone. Uh, and uh, employment in the healthcare industry rose on average about 1.4% annually over the past five years compared to across all industries where we actually saw a decline of about 1.1% overall employment in Ramsey County during that time frame. Uh, specifically services for the elderly and persons with disabilities industry, this industry in particular saw no decline in overall employment across the period of the pandemic so far, seeing average employment growth of 10.1% employment on average annually over the past five years, which is an addition of over 5,000 new workers into those specific older adult services companies. Uh, so very significant growth in some of these critical areas within our healthcare industry. Similarly, residential mental health and substance abuse employers saw an average annual employment growth of 11.5% on average over the past five years. So it's a smaller number in to total overall employment, but very significant for those employers, a really high demand that is further constrained by our tight talent pool. Looking into the future, industry employment is forecast to grow by about 1.2% on average annually in a baseline, more low growth pessimistic forecast. And it could be even higher up to 2.5% average annual growth if we were not so tightly constrained by our labor market. And you'll see those two lines contrasted on the chart to the, to the right here, modeling those scenarios. So in, the healthcare and social assistance industry turnover is just slightly higher than what we have seen across all industries. Uh, it's about 9.6%. So that means typically about one in 11 workers is new on the job in any given quarter. And we see turnover is highest among workers that are identifying as two or more races. So we see that there's a retention opportunity here. There's, there's an inclusion opportunity that's a really vital to ensuring that we have a, have a strong and, and secure workforce that individuals are able to advance in their careers. So uh, this information here helps us to really understand, you know, what are the average earnings for employees in a particular industry? What does it look like for, for individuals that have been in a role or as the chart on the right indicates stable jobs over a period of time? And you can see uh, here, I won't go into all of the details, but we have some significant uh, wage gaps. When we look at, at youth employment for young people, when we look at our BIPOC employees, we see significant wage gaps uh, by race, especially among new hires of talent and significant gaps by gender as well. We see that, um, that um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, Black and Asian talent entering into those new stable jobs in Ramsey County between 2019 and 2020 had some of the lowest average wages among all groups shown here. And so we have um, not only the talent shortage to address, but we also need to really be certain that we're, we're providing opportunities for all to enter into those most high wage, high opportunity careers in our communities. And so as we get, begin looking forward to an economic recovery, it's particularly important to un understand that short, mid and long-term outlooks of these occupations where opportunities are most promising. And so the framework that we've been using at Real-Time Talent and with Ramsey County to a great extent um, is an origin gateway target occupation model. And this model, which is also used by the Rework America Alliance and many other um, partners, um, is an alternative way to consider entry-level, mid-level, and senior roles. And it's a little bit more inclusive of the multiple career paths that individuals take over a period in their lifetime and the related skill sets that are relevant both within and across career fields. So here I've developed an origin gateway target occupation model for health science careers in Hennepin County, or in, in Ramsey County. Uh, origin occupations include roles that typically pay under $42,000 uh, per year on average. That's that bottom bar there. They typically don't require uh, advanced degrees or credentials, um, in some cases, a certificate. Um, and these roles are available in high volumes. These are what we might typically uh, think of as an entry-level career into a field. Uh, uh, and you'll see here roles like nursing assistants, home health aides, pharmacy technicians that are in the greatest volume locally in Ramsey County. I've also included a shorthand key to indicate the roles that require some form of certificate or credential. Uh, that's marked by an HS, which means high skill, high demand, which is marked by HD. Um, HW is, um, signifies a high wage. 
Um, and then you'll see across the rest of the chart as well, OG, which means that there's an occupation gap or talent shortage, um, and AG, which means we're underproducing uh, uh, awards or graduates in post-secondary areas or with credentials uh, when we benchmark to national rates. And so you can see here just at a glance that we have a lot of opportunity and we have a lot of work to do here. Uh, right in the middle of this chart are gateway occupations, which are those mid-wage careers that pay between $42,000 um, up to the county average wage, which is about $62,400 per year um, uh, for a wage. And these roles are typically require those middle level skills, such as certifications, two-year degrees, or industry credentials. Though some might require a little bit higher level of education. And when we look at those gateway health science careers here that are available in the highest volume in Ramsey County, you'll see that four out of five of those are, are in those non-patient care roles. And so this is what uh, is so important about the focus of today's conversation, that these roles are often overlooked in the bigger picture of the talent pipeline development and they're very high skill, high demand. We're likely to have talent shortages. We're likely to have award gaps when we look into the future. I'd also add on one of the target occupations, which is the most high wage, high skill, high demand roles that typically require a bit higher education level. Um, medical and health services managers as well is an area where we will have some significant occupation shortages and gaps. And these roles uh, really share a lot of similar skill sets uh, and provide us an opportunity to really think about that whole career trajectory of our individuals. And these occupations have come up multiple times in Ramsey County as opportunities. Um, the 30 occupations shown here were identified last year as being best positioned for reskilling program development. Those have been recently displaced during the pandemic. And so you'll see here that uh, those same roles, those healthcare support occupations and medical and health services managers also appeared on this chart as well. So these are roles that we're really seeing persisting early in the pandemic, um, in the middle and, and now that uh, are continuing to be uh, promising occupations for us to focus on in the future in our community. And so I'd like to close out by just leaving you, of course, with a very <laughs> dense data heavy slide. I'd be remiss uh, not to have a couple of those in my presentations, but focusing in on those five specific occupations that we've been talking about, mainly in that gateway op opportunity area, uh, you can see that um, we, uh, we really are significantly under, underproducing um, uh, under developing talent in these in these roles, um, with under 100 trained, skilled local individuals who are currently unemployed in these roles, and more than 430 roles at a low estimate expected to open up on average annually in Ramsey County alone, we immediately see that even in a perfectly aligned, perfectly functioning labor market, and in a low growth scenario, we're still going to need between 350 and 500 more skilled individuals to meet what employers are needing in our county. And so I, um, I leave you with the list at the bottom of the screen. On the left, you'll see an idea of some of those highest volume opportunity occupations with high unemployment and low demand. And how, um, and on the right hand side, uh, job titles that align very closely in terms of the baseline skill sets that are needed, maybe not the skills, knowledge, um, industry level, uh, competencies, but the baseline skill sets map very closely between uh, these origin occupations on the left and the gateway occupations on the right. So as we're thinking about reskilling opportunities, tapping into new talent pools and expanding opportunities for those that have, uh, are, are facing a job transition at this point in time, we have many opportunities to explore. And so I am so excited now to turn things over to our panel and hear from our business leaders on, on what's next. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Aaron. That was amazing. Um, I think um, in reflecting on some of your data, it really does reaffirm, one, the importance of making um, labor market um, information as a part of our decision making as we think about programs and, and resources, but also as employers are thinking about the future of their growth talent is to really you know, we do need to build a more inclusive economy so that more folks can be able to access these pipelines. You know, it just seems like there's, there is a opportunity here for all of us to work more collaboratively together. So appreciate you and the partnership. Um, now I wanna just um, kind of segue us and turn us over to this panel of experts who um, 
really represent um, really amazing employers in our community. So um, first, I'd like to welcome AJ Matson from Health Partners. Um, AJ is a recruiter there and has been part of Health Partners recruitment team since May of 2019. She started off as a coordinator um, for the team about seven months and then was promoted. Um, she hires for um, LPNs, medical assistants, EMTs within the Health Partner Clinic. So welcome, AJ. Also from uh, Children's Minnesota, we have Jordan Vanderveld, who is the Talent Acquisition Workforce Specialist. Uh, Jordan currently works as a Workforce Specialist for Children's Minnesota and is a Global Studies graduate from the U of M. She has worked in healthcare for the past seven years um, in workforce development, has a passion for diversity, equity, inclusion. So welcome, Jordan. And then finally, we have an amazing team from M Health Fairview who are joining us. So uh, John Wittenberg is the workforce development consultant um, at M Health Fairview. I think John, we met maybe at the Midway Job Fair. I think that's what we saw you, each other in person then. Um, you've yeah, been working did. there for yeah, over 30 years. Um, various levels of leadership spanning the, um, different roles there, um, supporting you know out, inpatient, outpatient nursing, staff development, float pool management, um, cultural resources um, as well at the University of Medical Center at, at U of M as well. Um, as a workforce development consultant, John has definitely enjoyed partnering with community workforce organizations, colleges and high schools as well. So thank you. And then I am um, excited to have Tanya Vilshek, Vilshek here. Uh, Tanya is on our workforce innovation board. So great um, to have you here, Tanya. Um, Tanya has the, uh, is also a practitioner. She is a pediatric nurse practitioner um, and has a license from the University of St. Catharines and a master's of science degree in nursing and business and education from the University of Phoenix. Um, Ms. Velshek works as the manager of clinical workforce pathways within the workforce partnerships at Corporate M Health Fairview and is an advanced practice provider at the University Pediatric Primary care clinic. So she represents Fairview, um, again, on the Workforce Innovation Board. So we're really excited about her having being here. And then Michelle, um, last but not least, Michelle Nash has been working at M Health since 2015. She's a recruiter for nursing and nursing support. And um, when she moved to workforce development, um, uh, let's see here, sorry about this. Um, she was nursing support until 2021 when she moved to workforce development, where she supports the pipeline. Of, uh, with workforce development and community partnerships. And she has a uh, master's in HR management from St. Mary's. So I know I said that all very fast because I actually want you to hear from them, not from me. So welcome all of you. Um, I'm just gonna have you first start out by giving us a little bit of an overview about your organization and your company. So maybe AJ, if you wanna start, um, that would be wonderful. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Yeah, my name is AJ. I recruit for Health Partners. Um, and Health Partners is a large, well-known organization. Um, we have about 26,000 employees, um, 55 primary care clinics, 22 urgent cares, and eight hospitals. Um, so overall, the organization, it does consist of different companies, um, including the Health Partners branded clinics, Park Nicollet, Methodist Hospital, Regents Hospital, um, and then some smaller healthcare organizations in Rural, rural Minnesota and then Western Wisconsin. So um, that's just a broader overview. About yeah, thank Thanks, AJ. Jordan, can you give us a little overview of Children's um, Minnesota? And um, so Children's Minnesota is the eighth largest pediatric health system um, in the United States and the only health system in Minnesota to provide care exclusively to children uh, from before birth to young adulthood. Uh, we are an independent, not-for-profit system since 1924. We serve kids throughout the Upper Midwest at two freestanding hospitals in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and we have 12 primary and specialty care clinics, six rehab sites throughout the metro area, and consist of about 5,500 employees. Yeah, thank you for that. And then I, who's from M Health? is going to give us a little overview, which of the three of you. Would be willing I'll, I'll to do it. it. Thank yeah. you, Tanya. So I'm Tanya Vlishek, and thank you, Lean, for um, bringing us here today. So M Health Fairview is a combination of academic and community medicine, focusing on 
the research and education brought together by Fairview of the University of Minnesota and our University of Minnesota physicians. We have 10 hospital, hospitals and medical centers within Minnesota. So we have them in Minneapolis, Edina, Burnsville, Woodbury, Maplewood, St. Paul, Wyoming, Princeton, our Grand Rapids and Hibbing area. We have 100 plus primary and specialty care clinics, 10 urgent cares, two express cares, 40 um, rehab locations, medical transport with an ambulance, 36 pharmacy locations, behavioral health, 90 plus senior housing and care locations with over 34,000 employees. So we are quite large. We're spread throughout um, Ramsey, Hennepin County, Dakota County, pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think this, the depth and scope of just the work that you do, just all three of you demonstrate that there's probably a, such a plethora of different jobs available. Sometimes I think it's easy to kind of just think immediately of the, you know, the care positions, the nursing type positions, but it seems like you have a, you need a everything probably to keep your organizations running. So I'd like to have us focus on some specific roles that really are in that medical, administrative, clerical base, you know, non-patient care, but particularly those that require two years of education or less. And, and whether or not you could share a little bit about that demand and those openings right now. So um, maybe Jordan, can I start with you? Would you be able to start us there? Yes. So if we're focusing on uh, just these kind of medical administrative type roles where maybe they're patient facing, maybe they're not patient facing, I could name maybe 10 different job titles that you could be in at Children's. Um, there's probably more than that, but um, some of the more entry level ones um, could be things like family resource reps or contact center reps, where maybe you're just checking people in at the hospital. Maybe you're just on the phone um, all day, get, getting people scheduled. Um, and answering questions and things like that. Um, all of those roles, we have at least one of those types of roles posted at, at all times, I think. Um, some of the other harder to fill kind of roles um, get into those unit coordinator kind of position or like a health unit coordinator kind of position where it's a little bit more complicated. Um, and that kind of pairs with uh, the patient services coordinator. It's always kind of that front facing um, of a front desk of a unit of a hospital or right when you walk into the clinic. Um, a lot of those roles are just really harder to fill because you need really perfect customer service skills. You're that first person that they see. Um, you're there interacting with both patients, families, and then the healthcare professionals rely on you really for everything um, that's going on within those areas. Mm -hmm. um, and you're really the eyes and ears of, of, what's, of what's going on in, in that environment. So they're, they're, they can kind of start off entry level like that and you can kind of move your way up into those um, harder to fill kind of roles. Mm. Yeah, thank you. John, would you be able to address that same kind of question with, um, for Fairview? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, it's an area that I specifically focus on in, in working with our recruiters and partner organizations and individual candidates in terms of creating awareness around the, these types of roles. Just as Jordan mentioned, we have very similar roles starting uh, more entry level patient representative roles and then uh, they advance in some ways in terms of complexity and technology needed to to be able to uh, manage some of the workloads there. Uh, I might highlight one uh, newer role that we have, and I think it's a really innovative way of approaching uh, some of the workforce demands we have. And that role is called a visit facilitator or an in-clinic visit facilitator. So this is a role that exists in our clinic, uh, <clears throat> clinic areas. And while the primary tasks are really associated around scheduling appointments, being the first contact for a, a patient arriving for a checkup or a, a visit with their provider. Um, so it has that scheduling, administrative tasks, insurance verification, phone work, that sort of thing. 
they're also uh, in charge of rooming the patient. And by rooming, I mean they're, they're helping get that patient settled in, in a, an exam room so that they can then see the, the provider. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting new sort of approach to you know, us being able to manage those uh, patient care needs. And it provides this individual kind of a unique perspective around being able to um, do some very basic uh, check-in things, the height, the weight, uh, maybe you know, you know, using the blood pressure machine to get some basic information for the provider, enter that into our electronic health record, and then, um, then they're, they're back doing the, those other administrative tasks. Mm -hmm. So again, we have a wide variety of positions, but I just kind of wanted to highlight that one because I think it's more unique and new and uh, seems really interesting for an individual who is starting out in healthcare and may have a uh, interest in exploring, you know, I, I don't work with patients right now, but I might have an interest in that. And then how our organization can in the long-term support individuals who want to, you know, move into some sort of patient facing or direct patient care role. Yeah, I love that because a lot of times when you're starting out in, in a career, you're, you know, you're attracted to healthcare for a variety of reasons. You want to help people, you feel passionate about, you know, uh, people's health, but you maybe aren't quite sure which, you know, whether you want to do the patient care or not. So I really do appreciate just that kind of entryway that has some hybrid component that, that sounds really unique. So thanks for sharing that. Um, AJ, how about you guys? What type of things are happening at Health Partners in terms of kind of these entry level opportunities, perhaps non-resident, non-patient facing? Yeah, so we, ours are, they're titled clinic assistants. Um, it's very similar to what the others have mentioned with being that first face when you, you know, check in at the clinic, verifying insurance, um, using our Epic system day in and day out, taking co-pays, answering phones, um, being that go-to person for the rest of the staff in the clinic with any help they may need. It can be faxing, really anything where there is to help. I know that um, if there's other things that they need to keep busy, there's always things for them to do. Um, and we have about 40 of those positions open right now. Um, I've been recruiting for over three years now, and there's never been a time I haven't had a position open for a clinic assistant. So um, it's, it's, it's a great way to get your foot in the door. Um, mm -hmm. It is a plus having any type of healthcare experience, I think, when applying to these roles, but really it's, it's the best position to get your foot in the door with healthcare as well. So um, I see a lot of that, a lot of college students um, that are going to school to be a nurse or a medical assistant, they're looking to get um, a feel for the clinic setting. It's a great way to do that as well. Um, really associate yourself with other uh, medical assistants, RNs, and um, I just, I, I really, I think it's a great job. Um, it is a union position with health partners. That is something that um, is a little different from other employers. So with that, there's, there's set pay scales. Um, the benefits are really rich. Um, and we, yeah, just really anyone with any type of customer service experience. I know that a common thing is, something as simple as being a bartender or, you know, uh, just a bookkeeper, anything with that type of work is, is things that you can consider when applying to those roles. So, um, and we have positions from on call. So a 0 0.00 FTE all the way up to full time and anywhere in between that range. So um, there's a lot of flexibility with, with what people need in their work-life balance too. Yeah, I love that. I want to come back to some of those um, transferable skills, but before that, I want to just kind of put a pin in that, you know, it's fascinating to me that there's so many different titles for things that are quite similar. And so, you know, an opportunity here as we have this conversation and how maybe the county can help is to, you know, and I have a couple of staff on the call, but maybe that we could sort of think of how to translate that for, for, for in coaches and for, you know, employment professionals and for our residents to really understand some of that, right? Because the complexity of like how you guys have each structured those job titles, you know, we don't want that to be a barrier, right? If somebody's really interested in a set of responsibilities, it's sometimes the, the title could be really different amongst uh, different organizations. So that's just um, something that I thought of as we think about barriers to for folks. But um, in terms of the transferability of skills, um, I, I just love what you were saying, AJ, about just trying to think of 
you know, other customer service facing things, because really the future of work has us really rethinking customer service, you know, for a lot of folks, entry level um, is customer service to begin with. And yet, um, now you can do that in healthcare, potentially, instead of in a hospitality setting, or, you know, working in, um, maybe in retail or something. So, um, I don't know, Michelle, do you want to chime in on that a little bit? How, how does that translation happen? You know, what, what do you see as those strengths of those customer service folks? Like what would be other careers that people are not, you know, or maybe just positions that people are in today that you think, boy, they would make great folks for us um, I've, that you've seen? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. So I, I will say we love to see people with customer service backgrounds. Sometimes people, you know, in food service, um, whether it's McDonald's or a barista at Starbucks or a cashier at the grocery store, or, you know, big box store, um, any of those um, people skills. I mean, they know how to think quickly on their feet. They've got that smile. They know how to present to the, the customer. And basically in healthcare, our customers are our patients. Mm -hmm. And um, so we love to see people apply to those, but there's so many um, pathways to start. I mean, and we've got flexible positions that work with people that are in school too. So, you know, nutrition services, health information management, mm -hmm. scheduling coordinator, um, which by the way, those positions um, work from home remotely now, um, being an admitting like in the emergency room um, or in our clinics, um, a health unit coordinator um, was, a, was a role that um, Jordan had mentioned as well. Um, pharmacy tech, public relations, marketing assistant. There's just so many different uh, pathways. Um, John or Tanya, am I missing anything? Um, no. So really, Ling, what we've looked at is we've looked at the job descriptions and what people, when you're transferring, what your skills have been. And we're trying to um, make it a little bit easier so that when people apply, that we can look at them and the recruiters can say, okay, these skills could go with this position. Or we do some of the career counseling within our workforce to determine, all right, is this something you'd like to do? So Michelle and I work close with nursing assistants, right? There's many people that work in the food services or restaurants or and they're looking for something that you get the stability of insurance and your benefits. And, it, you know, it's really about educating that candidate. These are the different positions you could go to and then looking at that pipeline. So looking at, okay, I might start as a nursing assistant, then I might become an NST. I might go in and be an LPN or RN, or I'm at the service desk and I want to be a medical assistant and then we walk you through. So it's really helping that employee and then following back with them once they're um, employed and seeing that engagement. So it's really important with our workforce and the pandemic and everything in the healthcare to really reach back out to those employees to keep them engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's kind of what, um you know, Aaron was alluding to around the retention piece too, is, you know, so you have that pipeline coming in, having to crosswalk people around their skill sets to the right role, but then like how to, you know, and I, I would say that there's so much opportunity, like you saw Aaron's like steps of her chart. I mean, there, you can start in one and then there's 15 other things that open up to you and then another 15. So I just think, you know, there's so much promise here if people can kind of get in the door and then start to do the exploration. So I think that getting in the door is somewhat challenging for people though, because it's, they, if you are coming from something that's really different than healthcare, um, how do you get started? So AJ, I think I might kind of pivot that to that certification sort of training or um, question. Like, do you, um, how do you guys sort of translate like what people need in terms of a credential for kind of getting started? Yeah, and so for a clinic assistant, there isn't a, we don't have any certifications that are necessary to apply to these roles. Um, we do have a couple of other positions that are within corporate more so, so not the clinic setting, and those are, um, it's with our appointment center. Um, those ones sometimes require more of a degree, and then at that point, it's just associate's degree, bachelor's degree, just kind of depending um, on the role itself. Um, 
and that's scheduling appointments. You're being on the phone, you know, day in, day out with your, with the members and helping them with anything that they need help with. They're really that you're on the phone all day, every day. That's, that's the job. Um, I think really just having any type, whether it's, I mean, I, I know a common thing I see with people and their applications for the clinic assistant roles is um, they're on the sales floor at Home Depot or Old Navy or something like that. And really it just being a good communicator, um, a good listener is important in these positions as well. Um, and really just being personable and able to, to listen to these and help them and feel that they're trusted with you is, is a big piece for us. Um, so we don't have any necessary, you know, tests that they need to take or um, anything like that necessarily. But I hope that answers your question a little bit. It's a little tricky when we don't necessarily require something specific. So yeah, yeah. But I think that's what makes it very attractive too, right? Because people right. maybe don't have that thing that's specific. I mean, I think one thing I'm hearing kind of as a theme is there's not as many barriers to entry as maybe people think like, and the mm -hmm. attract and even like the hours, right? I mean, one reason why people are attracted to retail and healthcare is they're dealing with life and having to work nights or weekends because that works better. And you guys probably love that there, you, you have those roles that you need to fill, right? Because you're, yes. open, I don't know how often I've really thought about that. Like, you know, in terms of hours and days of the week, like, like mm -hmm. restaurants and hospitality really mirror what, what, what the healthcare industry really needs as well, you know? So Jordan, how about for you guys? So any sort of um, education or credentials that you think are really particularly helpful or again, a, a wide open door generally, but what about the next step up? Like even those, are there kind of some that really are helpful as they, as you kind of get in the door? Yeah. And same with what everyone else is saying too, there's no real, you know, we, we, for some positions, we look for customer service experience, like two years customer service experience at least, and that could be working at a fast food place. But um, if you realize, you know, maybe you're applying to some of these medical administrative kind of roles and you're not getting selected and you kind of want to, maybe you want to go out and um, do an additional learning um, I think basic life support certification, you could go out and get that. Um, I think somebody else said too that, that you can go and get a HUC certification, health unit coordinator certification, um, not a very long class. Um, we're looking really when we're, we're, when we're looking at people too, we're focusing more on their soft skills um, because it's, it's so customer service based that um, it's, you know, I would take someone that is really personable, really professional, um, over someone that might have a lot of experience, but they're not coming off really as a positive person. Um, so I, I it is kind of more around those soft skills because we can teach you a lot of the things that, um, are required for on the job, but yeah, if you're looking, um, uh, to get in and you're not getting selected for interviews, maybe even take a medical terminology class. I think that helps. So, mm -hmm. um, those are some things that we would look for. Yeah. Really helpful. So John, you've, you've been doing this a long time. What, what do you see changing here? You know, like you've talked about an innovative role, you know, is the future of work kind of impacting kind of the, the job? Is it, how, how is it different? You know, more people need those, you know, I hear the people skills, but guessing you guys are doing a lot using computers, iPads, things like that. You know, can you speak a little bit about kind of, um, you know, kind of these trends in these jobs and, and, and maybe what other things people can bring to the table or what could be gaps that would make sure. that job more challenging? Yeah, you know, I think a lot with a lot of our medical administrative roles, so we're a really large organization and maybe one of the benefits of that would be that we can kind of more specifically refine and define what a specific position is going to be instead of having it be more of a generalist type role where you're trying to do a number of things, mm -hmm. when we can create positions that are, that are very specific and then provide the support and training for an individual who maybe hasn't used a computer database much before. And so maybe that's a new area of focus for them. But we can, when we can do that, I think, to your point earlier, Ling, about we've got all these different positions across these organizations and it's confusing to people. I think that's where we as an organization have to work to support people through that process. All the things that 
AJ and Jordan and Michelle mentioned earlier, we're, those are all important things for us as an organization to find those people who have the right soft skills. And then we have to train and develop them to do that. And along the way, then I think there's those opportunities to advance through earn and learn programs that we, we offer where we'll assist people with tu tuition reimbursement or uh, grants and things like that to, to have them be able to have an opportunity to move forward and, and explore. Um, those are things that are in healthcare. I've always uh, appreciated the benefits that go along with working with a healthcare organization. We, we tend to really do a lot you know, collectively to help people move their careers along. I think you know, it's, it's a unique time with uh, the pandemic and all the, the things that have happened to every worker. And so I, I think the, the trend has been so uh, quick that sometimes people are looking and seeking and wanting the new thing. And, and the, some of this stuff doesn't move quickly enough for people. So I think that's a challenge again for organizations to figure out how we engage people and have them help them understand what what's the long uh, term benefits to you to be you know established in an organization and and advance you know my own personal story I started in an entry level position at Fairview about 35 years ago and uh, took advantage of the opportunities the organization provided to spend most of my career in leadership roles. And, and so I, I've done a ton of different things over the, those years. And it's because the organization really helped and supported me in allowing me to advance and do different things. And so for that, I'm a grateful employee at this point in my career. So I yeah. think that's the challenge for people to look at the long-term game and understand how it'll help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the pandemic really laid bare kind of the fragileness of, of a, our, some industries and, and, you know, people are reevaluating where they want to be, the balance, their balance of life. And certainly I know one of you mentioned um, the, you know, opportunity to work remote. Um, no, that's difficult, you know, in healthcare, but I, 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 there sounds like there are some opportunities, right? I know maybe that was you, Michelle, mentioned there's at least one role that um, has remote in, um, opportunities. Are there others that we should be aware of or any other thoughts on that? Um, I'll just add into that. I, I, I think, yeah, rem remote, I, and I'm working remotely for the most part right now, we all are. And, and um, as, as a piece of, there's a piece of that that's good and there's a piece of that that's tricky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we all understand what that means, I think. But there's a lot of people right now who are really seeking that. And it, I wanna kind of tie this back to your other question laying around, what, what's kind of the differentiator for people who aren't being selected? And I think sometimes what I've experienced is a lot of people are focused on, I only wanna look at remote jobs right now. And maybe that's because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they're very specific about certain shifts that they can and can't consider. And one of the things I think people who are struggling to kind of get into the oper an operation somewhere might be look more broadly at what opportunities, just because your day shift, it might be the preference, don't consider something else. Mm -hmm. Back a long time ago in my career, I took a night shift position. It wasn't what I wanted to necessarily do. Mm -hmm. It made sense for my wife and my family at the time. Mm -hmm. It was probably one of the better things I did for my own career long-term because it gave me a whole new perspective on how things operated and what happened. Uh -huh. And it provided an opportunity I probably wouldn't gotten otherwise. And so, uh -huh. you know, I didn't do that forever. And that's the cool thing about healthcare. There's always new opportunities to transition and do different things. And sometimes a step in a different direction might open up a whole new avenue of opportunity. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, sometimes just getting your foot in the door and you guys represent such, you know, uh, large and really kind of uh, employers that just have so much opportunity once you get in the door, right? And so sometimes you do start out in something that, you know, wasn't your first choice, but, you know, the ability to sort of move along sounds like something that you all have done, maybe even in your own organizations and know countless people who've done so. 
Um, I think I want to end with, um, we just have like maybe two minutes. So I don't know if one of you has an interest in this topic, but I'm particularly interested in like kind of the on the job support that people would get once they get in their role, you know, especially with Aaron kind of highlighting the retention piece, you know, are you, you know, as we have a very diverse workforce base in Ramsey County, you know, are the supervisors getting supported to how to manage a, a, a younger generation? Are they getting some um, opportunity to um, lean into how to create an a inclusive work culture? I don't know, Tanya, maybe you went off mute. Are you, would you be willing to share a little bit for a few minutes and then we'll end with you here? Yeah, thank you. So what we've really looked at with the diversity inclusion, I wanna kind of carry on what John had said. It's really important to apply, okay? What's the, you know, the worst thing? You're gonna get a job. So I always tell people to apply, even if the position doesn't meet your requirements, because we do offer some flexibility. So we've looked at how can we be flexible because of daycare? How can we be flexible or assist with English as a second language? What kind of resources can we provide to those individuals? That's where we're following back with the employee to really say, how are you doing? Did you get the right training for that? I, you know, for the computer system, or um, maybe you're not understanding or the connection because English is your second language, right? Mm -hmm. We want to be able to assist and M Health Fairview is looking at international nursing and different people of, you know, different cultures and backgrounds and really how can we mentor the employee through that process? So whether you're coming in as a front desk or you're coming in as a nurse or you're coming in IT or HR, really looking at those workforce um, pathways and trying to assist as well as we're educating managers, supervisors, leadership, mm -hmm. this, you know, we need a little bit more time or some employees need that extra assistance to make them successful into that position. Because at the end of the day, we want to keep you as our employee. We want to be mm -hmm. able to, um, if you want to mm -hmm. stay in that job or mm -hmm. move on to a further, further jobs, because we try to create that pathway to mm -hmm. assist you to move forward. Yeah, that's great. You know, I'd be remiss not to mention, you know, we've been doing a lot of work with refugees, particularly the Afghan refugee community. Yeah. So I'll probably reach out to all three of you, but the, the you know, Ramsey County is just home, like the home of what ends up being a lot of different refugee groups. So again, another untapped talent pool, you know, we, we just feel like there's a lot of layers of hidden hidden workers that we have to continue to work with our employers on. But thank you so much today for your time. I know we have a lot of counselors here that are, you know, really have learned something and probably have some more questions. Um, I'm going to follow up with each of you to see if maybe there might be one particular source of a contact, if anyone had some follow-ups, maybe getting a few of those job titles that are those entry level and some links to maybe those as a follow-up for some of these job counselors might be very helpful. We want to have some kind of feedback where they, they you know, they, they receive something tangible here in addition and, and Aaron's report and all that's really helpful as well. So thank you so much for, to all of you. Um, grateful. Thank you for doing business in Ramsey County and your support of our residents, our employees and all of that. So um, really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to now, you know, we're, say thank you to everyone for attending. What um, we're going to now do is uh, transition into kind of an optional networking time, particularly with a couple of our uh, training providers. And so Karen Berg is um, on the line and Karen is one of our um, planners here in our department and works a lot with our career seekers as, as well as our employers. And so Karen's going to facilitate that discussion. Um, we're going to allow everybody to kind of chat and talk and ask questions. And I know we have a couple of other folks that are going to be joining her. So I want to thank everyone for attending and we'll transition into this networking time now. So thanks, Karen. Ling, what a um, wonderful panel, great information. Um, and so fun to see so many folks today on the call. Um, first, what we're going to do is hear from two of our community training partners and um, there are several other training programs um, that uh, I think we will put a link in the chat to our Ramsey Means Business uh, training dashboard, but we are featuring two of those 
training partners today. Um, first, we have Karen Jardine. Karen Jardine is an assistant supervisor with St. Paul Public Schools Adult Basic Education. She has worked in ABE for the last 25 years supporting students at the Hub Center in their Adult Career Pathways programs. So we'll be hearing from Karen in one moment. And then our second speaker following Karen will be Andrea Peterson. Andrea is a program manager. She's worked uh, 14 years for hired, serving participants with a wide range of barriers to obtain employment through career navigation services and job training programs. She manages and oversees programs in career pathways, assists with participant recruitment and assessment, helps job seekers develop employment and education plans, oversees program evaluation with data tracking, and provides job placement services. So with these two speakers, I'm going to go ahead and ask Karen Jardine um, to tell us um, some of uh, the details about the programs there at Ronald Hubs regarding medical office training. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, so good morning. I, again, I'm Karen Jardine with the Hub Center and we, um, are an adult education program. And if you're not familiar with adult education, we are serving adults who are reading at a level be below a 12th grade reading level. So we have um, adults that are second language learners. We have adults who are looking at getting their high school diploma, GED. We have adults who are looking at going into college and preparing for that pathway. We also do a number of job training classes and medical office is one of those classes that we have been doing for around 10 years. We started partnering with health partners and St. Paul College to run this program and it's evolved and changed throughout the years. And right now what it looks like is that we are um, running this class. It's a 12 week class. It um, is offered for eight hours a week and students, are coming in and are eligible for the class at a, what we call ELLC. So we are working primarily with our immigrant refugee population and helping them get, gain the skills that they need to go into the medical office field. And it was really great. I had contacted Karen about being able to connect with employers. So I timed it well, I guess, and um, was able to hear a lot about what um, these companies are doing. and. It's exciting to hear that they don't need a lot of official certificates. However, I do have a couple questions and I'll wait until later. Um, but Tanya had mentioned um, the ELL population and being able to support and um, help individuals move up into companies. And that's what we also want to do is to give them the skills that are needed. So our medical office class um, really concentrates on customer service skills something that all of you mentioned, and we have a, a customer service certificate that we um, give them upon completion, and that is based on actually the Retail Federation customer service certificate. So we have pulled curriculum and materials from, from their um, lead. And then we cover a lot of medical terminology, medical terminology, something that um, one of you had mentioned also, because it's really important that they understand what people's needs are when they're coming into the office and they have that dialogue and that understanding down. So that's a big part of the class is medical terminology and customer service. And if you're not familiar, we, we do a um, certificate program with North Star Digital Literacy. So students are required to go through the modules of basic computer skills, email and internet during that class. So they're getting those North Star certificates at the end of it. So that will also help with them, um, their skills on the job. So those are a few areas that we really concentrate on. And then we, we do some career research, we do some investigating of what type of jobs you want. And what happens is a, a number of our students actually are very interested in going into medical interpreting and translating. And so we will refer them on to, Century College has a program that we've referred them on to because I think that's a wonderful fit. Our students are bilingual, trilingual, they have multi-languages, and if we can help them kind of partner with um, 
with that aspect of their skills, then I think it's really positive for them to move into different positions. So that's kind of the rundown of our class. Um, again, it's a 12 week class. It, it um, hits on a lot of important points, but they're not, and I guess I want to do that caveat that they're not leaving with an industry recognized certificate in the medical office fields, but they're leaving with these skills. And so that's why, again, I'm going back to the idea that you guys all mention that they don't need anything specific for some of these entry level positions. So that's exciting to me. And I'm glad to also hear that we're kind of hitting the mark on some of the um, topics that we're covering in the class. So I ran through that quickly, but that's, that's a grassroots medical office at Hub Center. Thank you, Karen, that is You're wonderful. <laughs> Yes, and feel free to go ahead and put the Hub Center link into the chat we'll box. So, yep, so people can connect with you and to those programs. Um, fantastic. I'm going to turn it over now to Andrea Peterson from Hired, and she's going to um, tell us the, um, uh, the details about her training program there at Hired. Great, thank you, Karen and uh, Ramsey County for hosting this event today. I'm glad to be here. I'm Andrea Peterson, Program Manager with Career Pathway Programs at Hired. Um, I do have a couple um, slides here that I'm um, pulling up to share um, with information about Hired's Medical Call Center training. So let's see if I can get this to share. Was oh, it sharing? It, it was, okay. it was One there. Second here. I can't get the slides down. All right, well, I'll just share it like this. So a little bit more about Hired. We are a nonprofit. Uh, we do have locations throughout um, Hennepin County, Ramsey County, Dakota County. Um, you can see uh, we have our mission, vision and values, Hired nurtures purpose and advances economic opportunity for all through individualized employment and career services. Um, our vision is empowered people and families, a prepared workforce, and an inclusive economy. Our values include putting people first, going the extra mile, advancing equity, and working together. We do have four core programs at Hired. We have Family Stability, our Career Pathways Training Programs, Opportunity Youth, and Dislocated Worker. Um, so within our Career Pathway Training, we offer a Medical Call Center Training Program, um, which is short-term training. We assist job seekers to gain long-term careers. Um, it's industry focused in the healthcare field. Um, participants gain knowledge, skills, and credentials, and the training is free. And we are working with employer partners that are engaged in the training program. So our medical call center training prepares participants to interface with the public um, through call center positions, patient scheduler positions, those positions that the employer uh, employers on the panel were just talking about. Um, Hired's program, similar to the, the medical office program that Karen was speaking of, we include some healthcare terminology, customer service skills, computer skills, really focusing on basic computer, internet, um, Excel, Word, email, and typing skills. We are partnering with uh, Minneapolis College to offer eight hours of mental health first aid training. Um, participants uh, gain job search skills. We work through resume development, interviewing techniques, researching different companies and opportunities, job search methods, networking. We bring employer guests into the classroom to speak about their companies and opportunities and make connections to our participants. And then Hired works in coaches and supports participants as they job search and finding a good fit uh, for employment upon completion of the training. So there's various certificates that participants earn, North Star Digital Literacy, the Mental Health First Aid Certificate, um, the NRF Customer Service Certificate. We have opportunities for people to take the Microsoft Office Certificates and then a Hired Certificate of Achievement. We are running five classes in 2022. Uh, we do have a class that's coming up on February 7th. Um, so we have about 10 applicants for that class right now and more applications coming in. Um, the training is six weeks. It's Monday through Thursday. We're currently doing online training from 9.30 to 1.30. 
and looking for individuals that have a high school diploma or GED, um, low income priority, one year of recent customer service, um, could be retail, fast food, um, any type of customer service experience that they bring, clean criminal background uh, with ability to pass that DHS background check, and then coming in with some computer and typing skills and reading skills. We are partnering with Neighborhood House in St. Paul as an ABE partner. Um, so they are providing extra support with this program. Uh, we do have loaner laptops for individuals that are looking um, to do the online training. Um, if they don't have a laptop, we can borrow one out. We have some support services for interview clothing and transportation. I talked a bit about the job skills that our program covers. Um, they have access to Coursera classes as well. Um, and then different job leads and connections to employer partners. Um, we do have an application process for our training program. So if you go to Hired's website, hired.org and go under career training, you're able to find um, more information about the medical call center training and the application. If you have a participant that's interested, we review the application for eligibility, have them do a typing assessment, complete an employment plan, get a photo ID, and they're ready to go to start the class. So like I mentioned, we have a class coming up February 7th. Uh, we are still taking applicants for that class. Just a quick um, slide here about our outcomes. Um, in fiscal year 2021, we had 55 enrollments into the medical call center training. 51 of those earned at least one credential and 40 of those started a new job during that year period. Um, since then, more of those individuals have started employment too. Um, average wage we're seeing around 17, 12 an hour. And demographics, um, a lot of females are applying for and enrolling into our training, 95% are female, 77% black indigenous people of color, and 48% are a parent in a one parent family. So here's my contact information. I can also put that in the chat, but also happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, this is exciting. Um, when we have this um, diversity of an audience here, the workforce professionals combined with our employer partners and the training partners are really the, um, the key to making this work for our residents who are trying to enter into these new careers. So I am excited about making these connections. Thank you for putting your contacts out there uh, for us to follow up. Um, this is a time right now, we have about 15 minutes left. We'd love to take some questions and discussion. Um, we can take questions for our training partners, Karen, Jardine, and Andrea. We can also take questions here from our, for our employers or from our employers. Um, feel free to go ahead and put those questions in the chat um, and um, we'll, uh, we'll get some discussion going. And thank you too for um, Liz Jennings. She's putting there some uh, opportunities that are being held from Career Force. Um, take a look at those. Um, still have a couple days worth of healthcare month here in Minnesota. Paul? Paul, did you have a comment? Karen, this is Megan Forgrave from the St. Paul Chamber. And I just put in the chat that during registration, we did have a few questions from people about what opportunities exist to get high school students um, either involved or familiar with opportunities. Does anybody want to speak to that perhaps? I think we did have a couple other training programs out there in the audience today. Feel free to chime right in. I think um, um, Moundsview School District was maybe out there as well. And maybe some of that is for the employers too, to say, are there volunteer opportunities or specific health fairs or anything like that that might be helpful? You know, this is John Woodenberg. I, I missed the first part of the question. Sorry, so maybe if you can repeat that one. 
because I think it had something to do with youth and I might be able to add some information there. And I can talk about volunteerism as well a little bit. Yeah, yeah, we have a few high schools on the on the call and there were some questions during registration about how high school students could either get involved with any of these careers or just in exploring what they are. So yeah, thank you for, for repeating. I was uh, in the middle of something else as well. Um, so at Fairview, I am the individual who really focuses on youth and students and um, and working with all sorts of learners actually and, and work with Andrea from higher as well. So nice to see you, Andrea. Um, I am open to connecting with students in uh, the school districts. I, in fact, more recently, I was over at Highland Park High School and I did a presentation for uh, the high school health cares class there around uh, health care opportunities and, and what it's like for that uh, opportunities within that career. One thing we didn't talk about today at, at all was uh, Fairview also has our senior services uh, division, uh, Ebenezer, and we're a large uh, system of uh, all sorts of housing, nursing home, uh, patient care, assisted living for, for seniors. And we actually do have some uh, roles that are available for high school students. Um, and uh, my colleague, Jill uh, Kortenhoff, uh, focuses on development of those roles and working with, with uh, the community around opportunities there. But we, we will hire some uh, high school age uh, individuals into uh, opportunities to work like as a resident assistant or an activities assistant. There's some culinary opportunities to help serve meals in our assisted living locations. And there are a couple of roles that um, are people who are 15 would be eligible to work. And, and there's shorter shifts, uh, kind of you know, early evenings when we need some more help with meals and things like that, where you know, it fits in with, good with a student's uh, uh, school and, and uh, schedule. And then from there, we have other opportunities. Um, I know right now the, the efforts to train and hire CNAs, there's opportunities uh, for that as well across uh, our organization to, to hire um, CNAs who could work in those uh, uh, senior uh, services settings as well. So I'll put the Ebenezer uh, link in, our, in the chat here. I was typing in my own right now, so that's why I was a little distracted, but hopefully that answers some questions there and I can answer more if you have some. Thank you, John. That is wonderful to hear these opportunities for youth and particularly even those 15 year olds. Um, so happy to put that out there. Our two other employers, um, yeah, AJ, um, do you have opportunities for youth there, health partners? We, we really don't have a whole t a lot of those, um, unfortunately. I do wanna answer a question though that I saw in the chat that asked if, um, our employers require reading, writing, or typing assessments during the application process. Um, so for our clinic assistants in particular, there is two tests that are required. Um, and that would be something that is sent to candidates after a phone interview. Um, there's a typing test. So it's basically a time typing test that they need a certain score of. Um, and then also a medical terminology test, um, which is a, a multiple choice format um, of, of just medical terminology. And we do have a study guide that we do send the, the candidates um, at that point. So those are two assessments that are absolutely required. You have to pass them to get a role if offered with us. Um, and, and that's done through another system um, with, with Volt. But um, I did want to note that it's, it's just, it's a requirement with it being a union role, so. Thank you, AJ. Thanks yeah. for um, monitoring those um, questions there in the chat. Yeah. There is another question here um, from coming from Dawn. Um, working with people have found that a number of residents uh, do not have their vaccination for COVID. Are there jobs in healthcare um, that a person can do without uh, required vaccination? We'll give that to any employer who would like to um, address it. I can speak to that quick. Um, it's so for health partners positions, we do require the vaccination. 
Um, but there is for all of our positions, whether it's work from home or not, um, but there is, um, you can do a religious or medical exemption request. It just has to be health partners approved. Um, so that's how, that's how it is for health partners at this time. Yeah, this is John from M Health Fairview. Our, our policy is exactly the same. Um, it is an employee requirement now, but there are some potentially you know, opportunities to uh, request an exemption. Um, the other thing I was going to mention earlier was a, you asked about volunteer opportunities, and you know that's been one we across our organization we do have opportunities for uh, volunteering both for our uh, teens who want to learn more about healthcare careers as well as uh, individual adults who are interested in that. Part of certainly part of the issue right now is we're back in. Um, situations where visiting, you know, is highly restricted given the pandemic. And so, uh, while I think we have some volunteering opportunities going on, again, they're probably pretty limited right now due to the pandemic. Super. Thank you, John. Um, another question coming in a chat. What is the general expected typing speed for these front desk type roles or these administrative clerical roles? So for our clinic assistant um, typing test, the data entry test, it's 4,000 keystrokes per hour. <laughs> I don't know what that equates to in, in, in regards to words per minute necessarily, um, but that is the, the requirement for our, our role. Thanks, AJ. Does anybody else have a typing speed or keystrokes per minute in some of the jobs that we've been um, discussing this morning? Nope, so maybe maybe not. Um, looking at some of those other skills on the, the min uh, requirements. Um, so we may have we may have some. I just honestly don't know what they are. <laughs> I don't know what they are either. Yeah, super, thank you. All right. How about any other questions for anybody who's on the call today, um, including some of our other workforce professionals? All right, we've got another um, person in the chat here. She has, he or she has several um, questions, but I have, let's see here. Oh, thank you, John. You're on it. You're on the chat. Thank you. Brian. <laughs> yeah, again, the question is about whether if you have medical terminology or not. And, and that's, it's helpful, but it's not necessarily a requirement of many of our roles, so. But it is something you can do, as I think all of us kind of suggested, you know, good to do to, you know, enhance your visibility and, and skill sets, because it will help you. Yeah, and to go off of that, too, we don't have a certificate you have to have for medical terminology necessarily. It's just that there is a test that's required after a phone screen to be further considered. And, and you can study for that, too, which is why we do attach a, a medical terminology test on um, onto that email, so. Wonderful, I'm not seeing any additional questions. If there are some, you can feel free to take yourself off mute um, or comments for us today. Well, what we've heard today is um, that there are um, fantastic opportunities in these roles that are not um, necessarily um, direct patient roles. Um, we hear a lot about those um, direct patient care roles. And um, as Ling mentioned at the beginning, um, sometimes we, um, we are not uh, keeping these, um, these other roles, which are really, really critical to um, these functioning healthcare systems. We're not keeping them top of mind. That is exactly why we wanted to gather this group together today um, to draw out that information. Um, 
and to bring in the workforce professionals who are working with our residents who are seeking new careers and opportunities. So um, with that, um, I want to say thank you very much um, to our St. Paul Chamber partner, um, helping us orchestrate, um, invite, uh, coordinate um, uh, the session today. Thank you to our employer partners. Um, we are um, we are eager to continue our dialogue with you to assist with your workforce development. And thanks to our training partners, um, as well as our workforce professionals of the community. Uh, watch for more from us, more invites um, regarding uh, future events here in 2022. And have a wonderful weekend. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you.